Okay. Shall we get started? Yes. All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you all for being here. My name is Sara Cosame. I'm a professor of history at the University of California, San Diego, an advisory member of ACERE, and I'll be your moderator for today. I'm going to work hard to make sure that we keep everything moving swiftly here so that we can get through the information that we have to share with you all. ACERE, which stands for the Alliance for Cuba Engagement and Respect, is a coalition that has the mission to promote progressive policy and respectful relations between Cuba and the United States. Today, we have in store for you an array of speakers and short videos that will address current US policy to Cuba, its problems, and some ideas for change. In 2017, and by executive order, President Trump imposed a series of sanctions on Cuba. As part of his bid for the presidency, President Biden later campaigned on a platform that promised to rever reverse those sanctions, something that he has not yet followed through with. As Biden nears the end of his first term, his Cuba policy has come under increased scrutiny. International pressures against the U.S. embargo and sanctions on Cuba continues to grow, particularly from U key U.S. allies in the region and in Europe. Two weeks ago, the United Nations General Assembly once again voted for the 30th year in a row now to condemn the U.S. embargo. The U.N. resolution was approved by 187 votes. The only two countries to vote against it were the United States and Israel. In the meantime, amidst an economic and humanitarian crisis, the Cuban government continues to broaden spaces for the private sector and has said that it is open to U.S. measures to support it. Last week, the annual Havana International Fair brought business people and investors from around the world to the island, including numerous Cuban Americans who are still hoping that Biden will lift restrictions and facil facilitate trade. Today, we're gonna to hear from Cuban, Cuban American, and US business owners who will give us a sense of the implications of Biden's policies on their ventures. Despite years of mutual hostilities, mass migration from Venezuela to the United States, in part due to US sanctions imposed on Venezuela, have recently motivated Biden to lift sanctions there. If 23% of migrants presenting at US ports of entry this past September were Venezuelan, another 19% were Cuban. Cuban officials, meanwhile, continue to plead with the Biden administration to open talks that could lead to sanctions relief and a corresponding reduction in immigration to the US. Some people are hopeful. Recent changes, including in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, could help remove roadblocks to change on US sanctions policy in Cuba. So some of the guiding questions for our conversation today will be, one, what is the status of the Biden administration's policy on Cuba? Two, are there new opportunities for change in US Cuba policy? And three, what could the Biden administration do to support Cuban people and benefit US people? We're going to be hearing from four speakers. John Felder, president and founder of Pre Premier Automotive Export, who will share his experience becoming the first exporter of electric cars to Cuba and will suggest measures to make trade with Cuba easier. William Leo Grand, professor of government at American University's School of Public Affairs and a US-Cuba policy expert. Dalia Gonzalez, assistant professor at Havana University's Center for Hemispheric and United States Studies, uh, also a US-Cuba relations expert. And Hugo Cancio, Cuban-American business owner uh, who participated in the Havana Fair last week, the Havana Business Fair. Before starting the dialogue with our panel, we're going to have a short, maybe five minute keynote presentation by Hugo Cancio. He couldn't be with us live, but he sent a video to share his experience as a US businessman working in Cuba. We'll, we will then watch a short video about the business fair in Havana. Um, and then we will ask our speakers to answer three questions about the effects of Biden's Cuba policies and opportunities for change. Finally, uh, once we're done with that, we'll have a 15 minute Q&A uh, and we'll provide some links with actionable items and close the briefing up. A uh, word on the Q&A before we get started. Uh, questions need to be sent through the Q&A button on the Zoom screen, should be right down below. Just click in and type the, mess uh, the question. 
Okay, uh, so let's get to it. Uh, Hugo Cancio is a Cuban American business owner. He's president and CEO of Fuego Enterprises on Cuba, on Cuba travel, travel, and the Cancio Foundation. He has over 27 years of experience as lead expert and lecturer on Cuba and the US Cuba relationship. Uh, he couldn't join us on Zoom, so we're going to watch this video. Take it away. Sadly, the Biden administration has done nothing yet that indicates that it's going to support the Cuban people, especially the emerging uh, private sector in Cuba. Uh, there's been a lot of buzz. There's been a lot of, um, a lot of um, conversation with members of the Cuban-American community. I've been part of them, part of those conversations at the State Department level. Uh, but it's been something that has, they've, been, they've been having this conversation, but nothing has materialized so far. But one of the things that the Biden administration could do, aside from helping the, the private sector, is what I've always told the administration, any administration uh, in Washington, to uncuff our hands, meaning, you know, take off the cuffs from us Cuban Americans that want to be part of the economic and political transformation of our native country. At the end of the day, we we're born and raised here, and, and who is any government to tell me uh, what should I do or not do? Uh, in the country where I was born and raised. I mean, I follow the rules of law. I follow the, the unjust regulations that do not allow me to invest in my country because I'm an American and I'm a law-abiding citizen, but it's an unjust measure. So the same policies that they have when it comes to travel to where American citizens born and raised in the United States, if they want to travel to Cuba, they need to have uh, be part of a, one of those categories of travel. But Cuban Americans, we could travel freely because this is our country of origin. They should apply the same logic, right? So, okay, there's an embargo. Americans are not supposed to invest in Cuba. But if you were born and raised in Cuba and you still have emotional family links to your country of origin, you should be allowed to invest. So the, the, the rules of the embargo should be bent or should, but should be modified in a way to where the same travel uh, freedoms that we have to come and visit our, fam our relatives in Cuba, it should apply to business as well. Um, again, th there hasn't been anything. Uh, the Cuban government, uh, uh, believe it or not, is moving into that direction. Um, I've been advocating for Cuban Americans to be allowed to uh, participate in the economic transformation of, of the Cuban economy, to be allowed to establish businesses in Cuba and so forth for, for many years. And the Cuban government are now moving into that direction. They still want to step behind, though, which is which is they should reconcile the fact that we're all Cubans and it doesn't matter whether I live in the United States. I shouldn't have a MIPIME or under somebody else's name. I mean, Cuban and Cuban Americans or Cubans living abroad should be able to come here and establish their own MIPIMEs. Uh, it's not that we should be authorized to invest in, in local MIPIMEs. We should have the right to have our own MIPIMEs in Cuba and be part of that process. That will be like the icing on the cake. But in the part of the American system of government or in the parts of of, of uh, U.S. policy, I haven't I haven't seen anything concrete. It's a lot of talk, a lot of uh, gossip about what's coming. Uh, but I think they're missing the opportunity because Cuba is moving to the right direction, and we Cubans living in the United States, uh, we want to participate, and we're actually, you know, we, we're going to continue lobbying Washington to see whether whether those things that I mentioned earlier should be applied. Okay, so now we'll follow with uh, a short video on the international fair uh, that took place in Havana last week. U.S. foreign firms seek business in Cuba despite challenges stemming from U.S. sanctions. Business people from the U.S. and around the world are exploring business opportunities in Cuba, especially with the island's emerging private sector. Belly of the Beast reports from Havana International Business Fair. U.S. sanctions often make doing business in Cuba a risk, one that several U.S. and foreign business people attending Havana's International Business Fair this week are willing to take. Cuba is a market very important for the industry of the Estados Unidos. It's in the top five most important destinations for exporting pollo. The service we provide 
is from three ports in the United States. We're now completing 22 years of operation. A lot of the products that the Cuba is needing is in mid-United States, and we're going to be doing shipping and partials from uh, Louisiana here to Cuba. More than 9,000 micro, small, and medium-sized businesses have been created in Cuba since changes to Cuban law in 2021. It's still very new, but at least it looks very promising right now. Pertenecer al sector privado es un gran reto en este país, que es un país que se está abriendo las oportunidades. Los eventos donde se puede generar networking son muy necesarios para el emprendimiento cubano. The U.S. embargo is one of the main obstacles for trade between Cuban and foreign businesses. Aunque estemos en el exterior, toda relación que tenga con Cuba, el bloqueo. Afecta. Entorpece muchísimas negociaciones, a pesar de que incluso siendo nosotros una empresa extranjera, cuando hablas con productores, con empresas extranjeras, con bancos. Afecta el tema financiero, afecta la, la posibilidad de que proveedores te puedan abastecer, afecta la posibilidad de que te paguen adecuadamente. Nosotros fuimos eh, premiados con un financiamiento por el Hot de Innovación del Programa Mundial de Alimentos, con base en Colombia, y producto el bloqueo, eh, cómo poder ejecutar ese financiamiento. ¿Cómo poder hacer uso de esa divisa eh, sin tener una cuenta fuera de Cuba? Si no existiera el bloqueo, eh, la comercialización entre ambos países fuera, tuviera más fluidez. Y no tendrías que estar preocupado por licencias, qué productos podrían ser comprados en el U.S. Hubiese un flujo de comercio, back and forth, sin ningún tipo de, de situaciones. Title III of the Helms-Burton Act. A significant and controversial part of this legislation allows U.S. nationals to sue foreign entities using property in Cuba confiscated post-1959. It reinforces the embargo against Cuba and enables original owners or their heirs to seek compensation in U.S. courts for their former property being used or benefited from by others. Nobody's gotten a penny in compensation until now. Very soon, this guy could be cashing in big time. Mikhail Ben is a U.S. citizen living in London. He says his company is owed $440 million, not from the Cuban government, but from four cruise liners. Wait, what? The, the Cuban state took back control of the docks with the nationalizations. 56 years later, hundreds of thousands of U.S. citizens began traveling to Cuba, arriving at the same docks on cruise ships. Little did they know their visit to Havana would be used in a multi-million dollar lawsuit. Carnival, Norwegian and Royal Caribbean, all of them based in Florida, as well as Swiss-based MSC Cruises, were sued by Mikhail Ben. Ben demanded compensation for trafficking in confiscated property. The lawsuit would never have been possible if it weren't for Bill Clinton. In 1996, Clinton signed the helms burton Act. Its Title III allowed for lawsuits by U.S. citizens who hold claims to properties nationalized in Cuba. They could now sue domestic or foreign companies in U.S. courts for doing business on those properties. The U.S. government's goal was to shatter Cuba's economy by scaring away international investors. Title III unleashed the backlash by the EU, which called it extraterritorial and a violation of international law. To appease his European allies, Clinton suspended Title III for six months. And so did every president since him, every six months, for 23 years. Until Donald Trump. I'm announcing that the Trump administration will no longer suspend Title III. U.S. courts were bombarded with more than 40 lawsuits against companies from 16 countries. More than two dozen U.S.-based companies were sued. Amazon, Expedia, MasterCard, American Airlines, and of course, the cruise lines. The Title III lawsuits were on shaky legal ground. None had received a favorable ruling in court until Benz. The cruise lines argued that the Ben family held a lease to use the docks, but never owned them. The lease expired in 2004, 12 years before the cruise ships started taking U.S. visitors to Cuba. What's more, the Obama administration publicly encouraged U.S. travel to Cuba. The cruise ship visits were a big part of the historic normalization of relations between the two countries until Trump banned them in 2019. But none of this convinced Judge Beth Bloom. Bloom is a federal judge based in Miami, the stronghold of Cuban-American hardliners. Last December, Bloom ruled in favor of Mikhail Ben. She ordered the cruise ships to pay his company $450 million, including his legal fees. The Cuban people won't have to pay the bill, but they are paying an even heavier price. Helms Burton's Title III has scared off foreign investors. Cuba's economy is in crisis, 
battered by a barrage of sanctions imposed by Trump and maintained by Joe Biden. These days, Cuba's cruise ship terminal is mostly empty. Five years ago, all the Havana used to be filled with U.S. tourists. Now, it's hard to find one. The prospects of U.S. visitors returning to Cuba on cruise ships are dim. Title III could be suspended again with one man's signature, but Joe Biden has given no indication it will be his. Hey, you guys? Okay. Um, so now we're going to start the panel. Um, I'll introduce the three speakers and then ask uh, the questions and give them each a chance to respond, okay? Uh, first, John Felder. John Felder is former a former Chrysler executive who is considered a pioneer in the electric vehicle industry. Felder introduced the first electric vehicles to Cuba at the 2014 Havana Export Fair. In November of 2022, under the Biden-Harris administration, Premier Automotive Export received the first U.S. export license to sell electric vehicles to Cuban nationals. A new documentary called Driving Toward Change, and which you can access at www.drivingtowardschange.com, follows Felder's 15-year journey to obtain this license. William Leo Grand is professor of government at American University in Washington, DC, and former dean of AU's School of Public Affairs. He specializes on US policy toward Latin America with a special focus on Cuba and Central America, and has been a frequent advisor to government agencies, including the Demo Democratic Policy Committee of the US Senate and the Democratic Caucus Task Force on Central America of the US House of Representatives. He has been a fellow of several private organizations, such as the Council on Foreign Relations and WOLA, the Washington Office on Latin America. Lil Grand has written five books. Most recently, he is co-author of Back Channel to Cuba, The Hidden History of Negotiations Between Washington and Havana. He writes frequently for international and national journals, magazines, and newspapers. His latest piece is titled Taking, page, Taking a Page from Regime taking page from regime change playbook. It's back to confrontation with Cuba in responsible statecraft. Our third uh, panelist, Dalia Gonzalez Delgado, is assistant professor at the Center for Hemispheric and United States Studies at the University of Havana. Her research interests include policymaking processes in the US Congress, the Cuban American community and US Cuba relations. She's taught courses on US history and its political system and on US Cuba relations. Dalia is joining us from Cuba. It needs to be mentioned that due to US sanctions, Cubans cannot access Zoom without using a VPN, which is done frequently, but it reduces the quality of the connection. So if the connection falters with Dalia, we have a contingency plan. <laughs> uh, let's just hope that it works out and that we can hear her well. Okay, so let's get into our questions now. Uh, Bill, John, and Dalia, you each have five minutes to respond to the first question. What is the status of the Biden's Biden administration's Cuba policy? What changes to Trump's Cuba policy has the Biden administration made? And are there any new developments in terms of measures towards the private, the Cuban private sector? Um, John, would you like to go first? John? Oh, I'm sorry, Sarah. Oh, yeah. you wanted me to go first? I'm sorry. Yeah, if, you, if you like, if, if we can call That's on Bill. Okay. That's okay. That's <laughs> okay. I was... I was almost comatose, but uh, good afternoon, everyone. And I'm glad to be a part of this uh, program to talk about Cuba. Uh, obviously, I get questioned a lot about why did I get involved with Cuba, knowing that there was an embargo. Uh, I've always believed that Cuba being so close to the United States 
that that should be an automatic trade trading partner with our country, especially when we talk about trade deficits uh, in the United States, because we buy more products from overseas than we produce or purchase. So here's an opportunity to limit that trade deficit. And what better way to start than automobiles? Uh, as an automobile executive for many years, I've always looked at Cuba as one of the most fertile places when you're talking about automobiles because for over 60 plus years, Cuba has not been able to purchase any vehicles from the United States. So over 10 years ago, I began a journey to become the first person in the United States to get a license to sell vehicles to Cuba. Uh, in November of 2022, uh, the dream came true and I, uh, I became the first person in the United States to get that license. In December of this year, in fact, December 1st, we will deliver the first U.S. manufactured vehicle to a Cuban national. Uh, and this is one delivery that I'm really looking forward to because I do believe that trade is the key to ending the embargo. And I'm hoping that this one delivery, being a Tesla, will make enough noise around the world that it will make changes come to Cuba and its people, especially the private enterprises. Okay. Thank you. Um, Bill, William? Hello. Uh, I'm sorry my video is not working today, but I'm pleased to be with you. Um, President Biden has left most of Donald Trump's sanctions against Cuba in place. He's made a few small changes, which are not unimportant and worth mentioning. Last year, under pressure from Latin Americans who were threatening to boycott the Summit of the Americas because uh, Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua were not invited, uh, the president tried to mollify the Latin Americans by relaxing some sanctions on U.S. travelers to Cuba and by removing the limits that Donald Trump put on remittances, which is very important, obviously, for Cuban families. Another thing that they've done, which is positive, is to restaff the embassy, which had been downsized dramatically under Donald Trump, and reopen uh, consular services for Cubans seeking immigrant visas. The real impetus for them doing that, of course, was that tens of thousands of Cubans were showing up undocumented on the U.S. southern border and contributing to Biden's political problems there. The State Department had announced that it was going to provide some help for the Cuban private sector by relaxing some of the sanctions on international financial transactions which uh, right now pose a terrible obstacle for Cuban small businesses trying to either import inputs to their business or export their products abroad. Uh, Biden promised he was gonna do that last year. The State Department announced just a few weeks ago that they were ready to announce it and nothing has happened. And I think it's the domestic political issues that have kept the administration afraid to actually do anything more that's positive. So um, the big pieces of the Trump sanctions are really still in place, obviously the embargo itself, but a number of the restrictions that Trump put on travel, which has cut U.S. travel to Cuba by just about 50 percent from what it was um, prior to uh, the sanctions being in place and, and prior to the pandemic. 
Um, given the fact that the 2024 campaign is getting underway, uh, I really have my doubts that the Biden administration will do anything further positive in terms of its relationship with Cuba, uh, which is really unfortunate because, as I know we're going to talk about, uh, there are some real opportunities for the United States in having a better relationship with Cuba. Okay. Thank you, William. Um, Dalia? Eh, Dalia, ¿nos escuchas? Okay, I think we're going to listen to a video of her. Okay. Biden policy to Cuba is best described as continuing the sanctions and policies of Donald Trump. I do not share the general idea often repeated that Biden has done nothing regarding Cuba and that he has only maintained a policy that he inherited from Trump, as in a kind of inertia. First, because by doing nothing, he's doing something, actually. What we have today is Biden's policy towards Cuba and not just the maintenance of something that already existed. Secondly, because today in 2023, we are in a worse scenario that we had in 2020 when Biden won elections. Another widely repeated idea is a question that we are asked a lot here. And that is why Biden, who was Obama's vice president, did not return to that approach. It is very clear, at least for me, that Biden is not Obama as a politician. But above all, the context is different. The context in the United States with um, political polarization and populism and political crisis, the difficult policymaking process. And the situation is also different in Latin America, in the world, and of course in Cuba. And it is also different how they are reading current changes in Cuba, in Cuban economy, for example. And that's important because in politics, perceptions are key. The other idea that I think is relevant is that sanctions have been evolving. The blockade is, it, is not something that remains the same over time. Blockade today is very different from what it was 20 years ago or 10 years ago. So it is part of the nature of blockade that it has been changing over time. There are many examples of what the policy of sanctions or unilateral coercive measures has been in recent years. Biden maintained Cuba in the list of states sponsors of terrorism. There is absolutely no reason for Cuba to be on that list that list shouldn't even, shouldn't even exist, by the way. And the impacts of being there affects nearly every global financial institution. The UN General Assembly voted this month again by a large number against the blockade. And of course, blockade is a clear violation of international laws, and it is a violation of Cuban human rights, but also it's a violation for citizens of the world. I, I will give you one example. The United States not only prohibits American citizens to do tourism in Cuba, but in addition, European citizens are also affected. Tourists from Europe are threatened by the United States. If they travel to Cuba, they would have problems if they try to travel to the US they will lose the waiver that they, they have and they would have to request for a visa. Of course, that affects tourism in Cuba, which is one of our major sources of income, but also is an extraterritorial violation of liberty for people around the world. On the other hand, Biden has been very slowly reestablishing consular services, but incompletely with no reason not to reestablish it when investigation found no evidence whatsoever of anything in the case of the famous incidents of 2016. Okay. 
Thank you, Dalia, for uh, that comment. I think there was a report just last week um, showing that, in fact, the restrictions to travelers from Europe who go to Cuba and then attempt to get the waiver to enter the U.S. Um, are, in fact, um, having the effect of reducing uh, tourism, European tourism to Cuba. So thank you. OK, thank you all for that. Let's move on to our second question. Este, have new opportunities emerged for change to US-Cuba policy, particularly around business and migration? Could increased international pressure, potential changes in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee or other developments around the private sector and foreign investment have any significant implications. Um, uh, John, would you like to start? Yes, I can start. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I think that there's a, I, I think that there is a major opportunity for the Biden administration. And I've, I've heard everything that has been said thus far. And I know that, uh, it's a lot going on uh, with our president right now. Uh, so therefore, I'm sure that Cuba would not be uh, on the forefront of things to do right now. But I do believe that based on my success in 2022, that that is the beginning of a new era for Cuba and the United States. And just since I've had my license, there has been two more companies that have earned uh, export license to sell vehicles to Cuba. Uh, it, it took me 10 years to get there, but these two companies, it took them just weeks. So that's a very, very big positive. And I think that that trend will continue. Uh, as as time goes by. Thank you. Uh, Bill, should we follow with you? Sure, I, I and I will follow right on what John said. I think that there is enormous economic opportunity in Cuba in even even in the short run, but especially in the long run. Uh, we're just 90 miles apart. We're natural trade partners, as John said at the outset. Uh, U.S. businesses are eager to enter the Cuban market. We saw that when President Obama had his opening to Cuba and U.S. business people streamed down there literally by the hundreds. So many of the Cubans had a hard time actually hosting all of them. Um, and we're and and we're we're right now passing up that opportunity and leaving the door open for uh, our competitors uh, both from friendly countries and from unfriendly countries, uh, to get in there and and be the first movers and get a foothold on the island. And I think from an economic point of view, it's a terrible missed opportunity and and uh, really sad. Um, you know, in the 21st century, there are an awful lot of international issues that really span international borders. They're not confined to one country or another. And with Cuba being a near neighbor, uh, it's essential that we um, talk with the Cubans, deal with the Cubans, negotiate with the Cubans to cooperate on issues of mutual interest, whether it's um, to stop narcotics trafficking or to protect the environment or to control the spread of international pandemics, whatever it happens to be. Um, President Obama understood that and he signed 22 bilateral agreements with Cuba on issues of mutual interest in the last two years that he was in office. Uh, Donald Trump made no headway at all on any of those issues and, and cut off those dialogues. Um, the Biden administration has resumed some of them, particularly around migration, because obviously that's an issue of real uh, importance to the administration um, and around law enforcement. And I think that's because cooperation on 
uh, counter narcotics goes all the way back to the 1990s. And uh, the Coast Guard will tell you that Cuba is our most important and cooperative partner in the Caribbean to counter narcotics trafficking. The other advantage or opportunity that the United States has, I guess I would, I, I would frame it in terms of the interests of the United States that are not being served by the current policy, uh, is the right of US citizens and residents to travel freely to Cuba. Uh, their right to enjoy the cultural exchanges that could be had between Cuba and the United States. And we're not at a level in either travel or cultural exchange that we could be and that we should be. And it's because of uh, the ongoing uh, sanctions and general atmosphere of um, animosity, I guess, between uh, the U.S. government and the Cuban government. I can tell you personally, it is not a matter of animosity between the American and Cuban people who have always gotten along especially well. Uh, and hopefully, um, uh, you know, people in the United States will take the lead and build a kind of a, uh, a foundation, if you will, for a better relationship and pull the government along behind us. Um, and now let's hear Dalia's response, which will be in a video as well. Yeah. Of course, there is always room for changes and there are opportunities that we can take. But this administration doesn't seem to have the will or the capability to do even what Obama did. And I want to elaborate this idea with four comments. First, we have to consider the state policy, which establishes the general orientation for specific public policies. It has to do with the national project of the US and the not recognition of Cuban sovereignty. So no matter who the president is, could be Obama or Trump or Biden, in addition to any specific figure, elites, groups, specific interests that of course participate in the very complex policy making process, you cannot forget that state policy is the framework for any possible change. In a second place, I have to say that even considering state policy, of course we, we can have better relations than the ones we have right now, and recent history is the proof of that. And of course, we need to cooperate in essential issues for both countries, for example, immigration. My third point here is that we are in a difficult moment for changes, especially major changes like we need. 2024 is an electoral year with all that it, impl that it implies for, for Congress and for the president and all issues are affected by political campaign. And my fourth comment has to do with private sector. The Biden administration has announced some measures to support private businesses in Cuba, but has done nothing important so far. It is a long promised, but limited step to ease some restrictions. And of course, if, if, of course, if, if that finally happened when it happened, it could be good for some sectors here in Cuba, but at the same time, that policy have the declared intention of opening a gap between business owners and the Cuban government. I'm muted. Sorry, so there was some noise outside, so I muted myself. Okay, let me start over. <laughs> for uh, So thank you for your responses, and we're going to get on to the third question, but I just want to remind people that after uh, the next question, we're going to be open for a Q&A session. So in order to ask a question, and now's the time to do it, you should look down at the screen, at the Zoom screen, and click on the Q&A button, and 
submit your question through there. Um, okay, so our third question. What could the Biden administration do to support people, both in Cuba and the US? What could it do to um, improve, like John, particularly in relation to the Cuban private sector and the type of work that you do? What are some concrete things uh, that the Biden administration could do? Um, and the same for Bill and Dahlia for the sectors that you sort of work more, most closely with. John? I, uh, well, one of the things uh, that the Biden administration could do is to have a link between the banks. Right now, the private sector, and there's more than 5,000 and growing, if they could get some help with financing, that could change everything within Cuba. And those private companies are providing better incomes for the Cuban people. And that is a win-win. So I think the only thing missing is being able to have financing so that they can buy and trade and do business. So I'm hopeful that that change will come very soon so that the, the, the banks can be linked. And I know that uh, what's keeping that from happening is because uh, Cuba currently is on the terrorist watch list. And let's hope that they get removed from that. And I think we're gonna see major changes once that happens. I'm very optimistic. Bill, William. Thanks. Uh, well, I have to say at the outset that uh, the Biden administration, the Democratic administration, ought to lift the embargo. Uh, this is a policy that has shown no positive results in 64 years and is just deepening the misery of the Cuban people and has no upside for the interests of the United States either. But that's not going to happen in the next 12 months. So let me suggest some things that the Biden administration could do that are politically more feasible, I guess I would, I would say. And the first is exactly what John was just talking about. Um, they should uh, reform the banking regulations so that uh, Cuban private businesses are able to open and maintain bank accounts in the United States. There should be two-way uh, banking uh, relationships between U.S. and Cuban banks so that um, you just make it much, much easier for anyone in Cuba uh, to uh, engage in, in business transactions. Uh, another thing on, uh, on the financial front is to lift the prohibition on what are called U-turn transactions. This is a little bit tricky, but uh, any international financial transaction that is done in U.S. dollars has to go through a US bank. And that means that if you're in Cuba and you're a private business person and you wanna buy, uh, say, a, a container's worth of frozen chicken um, and you wanna use US dollars, you're gonna have a hard time finding an international bank that uh, is willing to take on that transaction because it would conceivably violate the US embargo to engage in a transaction denominated in US dollars. So this is the kind of extraterritorial reach of the embargo that impacts uh, not only Cubans, but people around the world. A second thing to be done, it's already been mentioned, is to take Cuba off the State Department's list of state sponsors of international terrorism. Uh, it is only on the list for political reasons. Uh, Cuba is doing nothing to sponsor international terrorism. And the last uh, State Department report on terrorism doesn't provide any significant sensible rationale for why Cuba is on the list. Uh, the list really impedes Cuba's ability to engage again in international financial transactions because international banks have to engage in what's called enhanced due diligence if they are doing business with a client suspected of engaging in terrorism, which Cuba automatically is seen that way because they're on the list. And most banks just don't wanna do it. It's not worth it to them. And so 
when Cuba was put on the list by the Trump administration just days before the end of the uh, the administration, uh, several dozen international banks immediately notified Cuba that they would no longer do business with. A third thing that could be done, and again, this has uh, been mentioned earlier, is to uh, reinstate the waiver of Title III of the Helms-Burton legislation to put an end to uh, the filing of any new lawsuits um, whereby Cuban Americans who were not even U.S. citizens at the time uh, can sue anyone who engages with any kind of transaction with Cuba that engages in or makes use of property that they previously owned and was nationalized after the revolution. Uh, this is another extraterritorial extension of the embargo, whereby a European bank or European business that wants to do business in Cuba, if they happen to say open an office in an office building that used to be owned by a Cuban American who's now a naturalized citizen, uh, they can be sued in U.S. courts for that. Um, it's an incredible irritation in our bilateral relationship with the Europeans who think it's outrageous that we do this sort of thing. And they actually, some of them have passed laws um, to try to counter and block this. But uh, the design of this and the people who wrote it admitted it is to raise the political risk of any foreign company doing business in Cuba in the hopes that they can prevent private investment from going into the island and thereby stifle Cuba's uh, economic development. And a final thing that could be done is to lift the uh, existing prohibition on U.S. travelers staying in any hotel that has any proportion of Cuban government ownership. What that is, means, of course, is that a U.S. traveler can't stay in almost all of the major hotels in Cuba. Now, for an individual traveler, that's not a huge problem. You can stay in a small boutique private hotel or you can stay in uh, you can rent a room from somebody in a in a B and B. But for large travel providers like you know National Geographic or uh, you know that take thirty or forty people down uh, to Cuba on a trip at one time, they need access to the major hotels or they can't do business. And the prohibition on staying in hotels is one of the reasons that U.S. travel to Cuba is down so dramatically from what it was under Obama. So uh, those are, are things that could be done. The private sector uh, support is something Biden has promised to do already. Taking Cuba off the terrorism list uh, is a perfectly reasonable thing. And by the way, the administration is under a lot of pressure from Latin America to actually do that. And so we could enhance our relationship with Latin American countries by doing that. Um, reinstating the waiver on Title III would it, it take a major irritant out of our relations with our European allies. And getting rid of this prohibition on staying in hotels would uh, reinforce the right of Americans to travel wherever they please. Uh, thank you. Uh, now we'll hear from Dalia. The short answer here is lifting all sanctions, but I know that it is a dream right now. If you're asking about what Biden can do, using his executive prerogatives, he can actually do a lot. For a starter, he can remove us from the state sponsors of terrorism list. He can ban Title III of Helm Helms Burton Act. He can reestablish full consular services here in Havana. And those are just the easy ones. Although blockade can only be entirely eliminated by Congress, there's a lot a president can do to ease restrictions. And easy restri easing restrictions on trade and travel would benefit not only Cubans, but also American people. Of course, I am aware there is a difference between 
what he can legally do and what he can actually do. The, we have to consider some other factors. In reality, the issue must be seen at several levels and that in the conditions of the United States from the perspective of the great power that predominates in them with the geopolitical conditions, the range of acceptable policies within state policy is limited. US policy towards Cuba generates poverty, contributes to the growth of inequality, harms social cohesion, stimulates emigration, increases potential of social conflict. It is the population, not the government, the one that suffers the most. And the worst part, part it is that it is by design. I mean, the aim of US policy has been to make life as difficult as possible for people in the island with the ambition that it could lead to the overthrow of the government. And it doesn't stop there. The ultimate goal is not only to overthrow Cuban government, but to control the island because the essence of this conflict is the, the not recognition of Cuban sovereignty even Obama said it, that the blockade had not achieved it, its purposes and therefore it, it was necessary to change the methods, but to achieve the same goal. So at the end, if the, if the United States government wants to help Cuban people, could be Biden or anyone else, I if they really want to support Cuban people, they have to start by respecting Cuban sovereignty. Okay, thank you, Dalia. Thank you all. Um, all right, so uh, we've got about, we've got a long list of questions. We're gonna try to get through as many as we can. Uh, first, uh, you should all see, um, so we wanna point everyone to a list of things that can be tried to done, can be, that can be done to try to improve relations with Cuba um, and ease the multiple crisis on the island. You should see in your, uh, chat box, a list of um, links and uh, things that, you know, more information or things that can be done. Um, so, okay, let me go through a couple of the questions here. Uh, why don't we start with this one? Can one of the speakers explain to us what electoral political fallout that Biden or whoever the Democratic Party's nominee will be would suffer? Florida seems very unlikely to vote Democratic, for example, and the majority of U.S. citizens think that the U.S. and Cuba should have normalized relations. So um, perhaps, uh, Professor Leo Grand, you could answer this one. Uh, I can repeat it if you need. No, no need. Um, it's a good question. Uh, I don't think it has an easy answer. It does seem, particularly after the 2022 midterm elections, when the Republicans just really swamped the Democrats, it does seem unlikely that uh, Biden or any Democratic nominee is going to have a real shot in taking Florida. And yet they focus on Florida anyway. And I think there's a couple of reasons. One is that uh, at 29 electoral votes, Florida is the fourth largest uh, state in the electoral college and the only one of the first four that is really in contention because the others are Texas, California, and New York. It's also a state that Republicans have to win in order to put together an electoral college majority. And so Democrats don't wanna just throw in the towel on Florida, because if they can actually win Florida, they can win the national election. And a, a final reason is that even if a Democrat isn't likely to win Florida, putting effort in there is going to force Republicans, because it's a must win state for Republicans, to put time and money into Florida instead of putting that time and money into the swing states that are critical for Democrats, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. So I think that's the logic. I think that's been the logic of Democratic presidential campaigns in Florida ever since Bill Clinton in 1992. 
Um, and it's a it's a difficult logic to break, especially because Democrats have seared into their memory about the year 2000 when Florida was decided by 537 votes and Al Gore lost uh, the Cuban American community by enormous margins because the Clinton administration sent five-year-old Elian Gonzalez back to his father in Cuba. Okay, thank you. Uh, if anyone else wants to answer that question, if not, I'll keep going. Uh, John and Dalia. Okay, uh, so another one. Fully understanding the current limitations of current policy, are there examples of specific activities or programs of US individuals or US entities in supporting Cuban entrepreneurs in addition to obtaining export licenses? Do we have anyone who could answer that one? Um, I can talk a little bit about it, but I, John may know more about this than I do. Um, there are a couple of efforts uh, by organizations here in the United States to uh, help improve the capacity, uh, the management capacity of uh, Cuban small businesses. There's a, a program called Cuba Emprende, which is uh, partly uh, religious institutions and partly uh, a Miami group called the uh, Cuba Study Group which has been conducting classes in Cuba for uh, prospective entrepreneurs to just help them understand the basics of how you go about managing a business. Um, I think there are uh, a number of opportunities for microfinance in the case of Cuban small businesses. And in fact, a lot of that is actually going on already, um, but it, it uh, masquerades as remittances. So a lot of the remittances that are going into Cuba today are, are not just for increasing the consumption of Cuban recipients, but they're seed capital to get small businesses off the ground. I'd like to make one more comment uh, following up on uh, William. Uh, one area that I found very uh, interesting. I have a good friend named Dwayne Wickham, who is, who was a journalist for USA Today. And he travels to Cuba quite frequently, even now. And he is a journalist. And he goes there and shares his journalism experience with, with Cuban students. I have always been fascinated by that work because I think that the more positive things we can do between our countries, uh, the better it's going to be for everybody. And journalism are the people that write about it. <laughs> so that's very important. Okay, thank you. And I think we might have lost Dalia, her connection. Um may be faltering right now. So, um, okay, another question, uh, Bill, this one might also uh, go for you or or John, either one of you, but uh, this is good because uh, it's asking about what, what space there is in Congress uh, to sort of try to enact any change. So the question is, what can members of Congress do if they are not on the Foreign Relations Committee? <laughs> Sure. So, um, it, well, Democratic members of Congress, of course, um, can let the White House know that they want the president to keep the campaign promise that he made to return to Obama's policy. And in fact, a number of, of Democrats who have been, uh, who were very supportive of Obama's opening, people like Jim McGovern in Massachusetts, uh, have in fact done that. And there have been a number of um, open letters sent to the president by Democratic members of Congress urging him to actually move ahead and, and relax sanctions as he promised to do. 
you know, they can uh, introduce legislation, although I, I will tell you honestly that with a Republican majority in the House of Representatives, there's no positive legislation on Cuba that's going to get through this Congress. Um, but it is important that Democrats, especially in the Senate, where Democrats have control, um, to try to introduce some positive legislation there, whether it's about uh, lifting prohibitions on travel or uh, lifting some of the prohibitions on financing uh, agricultural exports to Cuba. So that if uh, Republicans in the House pass more restrictive legislation, when the House and Senate get together, the Democrats have some cards to play in terms of getting rid of some of those negative provisions. Okay. Uh, thank you. Okay, so another question, Bill, this one's also uh, posed for you. How does the Berman Amendment, excluding intellectual property, so art, manuscripts, film, video, et cetera, from the embargo, affect trade and investment, and how can it be publicized? That's an interesting question with regard to investment. Um, I don't believe that the Berman Amendment, which exempts essentially uh, art and literature and intellectual property uh, more broadly, from the restrictions of the embargo, I don't believe that that also exempts investment. Uh, in fact, I know that uh, it's not possible to invest in, say, uh, an artistic studio or workshop in Cuba by a U.S. investor. Uh, the Berman Amendment has been interpreted as, as only involving sort of the, the buying and selling of of uh, art and literature and, and so on and so forth. In fact, uh, there was an effort during the Trump administration to even try to um, block the sale of Cuban art in the United States on the grounds that it had become a business, that um, you know, uh, gallery owners and, uh, were, were going down to Cuba, purchasing Cuban art for resale in the United States. And and the argument was that, well, that's a business transaction, so it falls outside the Berman Amendment. I don't think that that's a legitimate interpretation of the Berman Amendment, but um, there has been pressure from conservatives and Republicans to try to restrict the scope of the Berman Amendment. Um, and, I, you know, I think it would be helpful, obviously, if the Biden administration would say something in terms of its interpretation of of the Berman Amendment, which I assume would have a broader scope. Okay, thank you. All right, moving on to a couple more questions, and then we're going to, I will direct everyone to back to the chat where you're going to see a call, a list of call to action items we'll review um, as we close out. So, all right, another question. As part of the Obama thaw, Cuba released dozens of political prisoners. To what degree do the panelists believe that the U.S. government is holding the release of political prisoners from July 11th protests as a prerequisite for any major movement on Cuba policy, including uh, the terrorism designation? I would, I would, I would take a shot at that. Uh, I really, uh, I don't believe that the release of political prisoners is in the mix. That's my personal feelings. Uh, and I would just leave it at that. One of the things that I've tried to do uh, in my relationship with the Cuban government and the American government is I've tried to uh, limit my exposure to politics because to get the license that I have Obviously, I had to appeal to the U.S. government and the Cuban government. They both had to say yes. So I try to stay out of politics. <laughs> okay. So, William, I'm going to leave that one to you. 
Thanks, John. Um, well, you know, the Biden administration has, of course, been extremely critical of the arrests that were made uh, on July 11, uh, 2021. Uh, and I think it has been an obstacle to a better relationship, uh, partly because the administration is is truly and legitimately concerned about human rights issues, um, but also partly uh, political because to do anything positive now on Cuba, uh, you know, opens them to being accused of having abandoned these people who are uh, in prison. I know there have been discussions between the two governments in which, you know, um, the Cubans have been told, Cuban government officials have been told that the, um, the prisoners from July 11 are an obstacle to improving the relationship. On the other side, the Cuban government has said that they're willing to even talk with the United States uh, about that issue, but not uh, in isolation from the issues that are important to Cuba. And so far as I know, that uh, is not a set of discussions that um, that have been begun. So I think it is a problem. Uh, personally, I, I think that yeah. it would be sensible for the Cubans to uh, sh show some amnesty for people who were arrested on July 11 for nonviolent uh, offenses. Uh, there was a significant amount of violence and looting on July 11, and I think you know people arrested for that would be arrested for that in any in any country. Um, but for people who were arrested for disorderly conduct and that sort of thing because they were marching in protest, uh, those people should be shown clemency. Um, okay, one sec. We've got a new one here. Um, okay, so this is a long one. Let me read it out loud. Uh, one significant, relatively easy step in improving relations between countries is for the Biden administration to make it a priority to staff the consulate to permit the resumption of visa processing for non-migrant non-immigrant visas. What we suffer for nearly all of the artist visas, including delays uh, for administrative processing, security clearances of the State Department is so unnecessary. Exceptions are occasionally permitted by the consulate, but it's so unpredictable or arbitrary. Um, the The question is not is not a direct one. It's more like any thoughts on this. Uh, cultural exchanges enhance our communication for better times, your thoughts. So is there a way to improve, uh, is there anything that we can do from Congress to improve the consular relations between the two countries? So I don't think this is something that Congress can be helpful on other than just sort of letting the administration know that they're concerned about it. Uh, it really is a matter of staffing of the consular section at the embassy. Um, there, the part of the problem is, is just that, that they're swamped, um, during the Trump administration, virtually no Cuban got a visa to come to the United States. Immigrant visas fell from around 30,000 a year under Obama down to 2000 a year under Trump. And the result is that there's a huge backlog of people who would normally have been processed for immigrant visas during the four years of the Trump administration, who are now lined up to be processed during the Biden administration. Um, and also there's the fact that there's a terrible economic crisis in Cuba right now, uh, which is prompting even more people than normal to want to, to want to migrate. And the, right now the embassy, uh, as, as the questioner noted, is um, focused primarily on processing immigrant visas, not non-immigrant visas, except on a very exceptional basis. And it does it does make cultural exchanges much harder to do because, as the questioner said, it's unpredictable. It takes a long time to get a for a Cuban to get a non non-immigrant visa, um, and it's really a terrible constraint. Uh, the only thing that can be done really is to uh, you know allocate more consular officers to work down there and maybe some to work 
uh, remotely from the United States to try to, um, you know, just ease the volume of people that are applying. Okay. Thank you all. Uh, I'm going to direct everyone to the chat momentarily before we uh, sign off. If you look, you'll see uh, Acere is posting several uh, messages. There's one about uh, John Felder's story um, of Premier Automotive Export. There's another one with background information, articles, recent articles, uh, giving more information. Uh, there's uh, Professor Leo Grand's uh, article from Responsible Statecraft and others. Uh, and then we'll have, we have the call to action. So uh, I wanna just take a second to sort of read some of these out so that everyone has a chance to see them. It, they won't, they they will disappear from the Zoom as soon as the Zoom is over, but there, but there are ways that we will get this list to you all. Um, so, all right, so the first one, contact the White House and the State Department to demand the following actions by the executive. One, take Cuba off of the state sponsors of terrorism list. Uh, there's information about its impact. Uh, also, number two, waive Title III of the Helms-Burton Act. Uh, it paralyzes foreign investment needed by the Cuban private sector. Number three, finally implement measures in support of the Cuban private sector. Uh, we were waiting for these a, month, a few weeks ago and they never came. So another one, follow the lead of Senators Wyden and Congressman McGovern and have your member of Congress send a letter, issue a statement or make pu a public declaration asking President Biden to act on the four things mentioned above and roll back the rest of the 243 restrictions placed on Cuba by President Trump. Another thing, reach out to Senators Cardin and Van Hollen to let them know that your bosses are interested in supporting their commitment to a more rational, humane, and effective policy towards Cuba. And the last, the last two, uh, support bipartisan legislation. Uh, Senators Klobuchar, Klobuchar, Moran, Walt, Marshall, Warren, and Murphy, um, have a resolution to lift the trade embargo on Cuba. And the last one, you can reach out to us at ACERE at Alliance for Cuba at ACERE.org. If your bosses uh, in Congress would like to join a congressional trip or are interested in a one on one conversation on US Cuba legislative history and ways to engage the subject. Uh, there are additional resources at the website, acere.org slash resources. Again, acere is A-C-E-R-E dot org. Um, I think that sort of sums it up. Thank you all very much for being here. Uh, and we hope that we can make some forward movement on the on these issues. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.